Okay, so this one here, we, we're looking at the chain rule. So there's how many embedded functions are there? Well, in, the outside functions log. So there's one. Inside of that is a sign function. So that's two. Inside the sign, there's a cube. And inside the sign, there's a 4x. So that's four functions in, in four, four layers of embeddedness. So when I differentiate this, my first layer is going to be differentiating the log. The second layer, which I'll do in a different color, I'm going to differentiate the sign. Okay. The next layer, I'm going to differentiate the uh, the cube, so I end up with 3 times 4x minus 1. And then the last layer is that horizontal compression, so times 4. So there it is. There's my four layers of derivatives, or four layers of embeddedness. Okay, probably should simplify that a little bit, but um, if you take a look here, we could probably put the cos and sine together and make it into cotan. So we'll do a little bit of simplification here. So I'm going to go y prime equals cotan of 4 minus 4x minus 1 cubed. Okay, so that's grouping that together. And then we're going to times by 12 here, 3 times 4. And then we have 4x minus 1. Oh, so that's going to be squared because I forgot to put the squared on there. Okay, so it's going to be the cube comes out front, that becomes squared. Okay, so the the other part of this is understanding how the derivatives relate to their original functions. And things that we key ideas for this are we want to take a look at the original graph where the slopes are zero. Okay, those are important. We want to, and that should relate to zeros on the other graph, on the derivative graph. So in this case here, for example, those are zero slopes. Those are zero coordinates. Okay. So it looks like this one's going to be it. Since this one has two zero slopes, this one has two zero coordinates. None of the other ones have zero coordinates like that. The other things we want to look for is negative slope, negative y coordinate, positive slope, positive y coordinate, negative slope, negative y coordinate. And the last thing that we want to look at is uh, the shapes in terms of the polynomials. If this is a cubic, this looks kind of cubic-like, the derivative should look quadratic. Okay, So we can kind of see that these two go together. Okay? If we take a look at B here, we have positives. So there's no zero slope, so it should not cross zero. So really the only one it should be is this one. We should look at the positive negativity. So it's positive slope and constant. Oh yeah, it's positive and constant here. Negative and constant. Yeah, negative and constant. And positive and constant. And notice that there's an abrupt change, so it is they're not differentiable at that point. So derivatives are not continuous. So it looks like B goes with that one there. For C here, notice that there's a zero slope here. There's only one point where it has zero. This one has three zeros. This has one. So they're probably going to be that one. We should double check. It's going negative. Yeah, negative y coordinates. It's going up. Positive y coordinates. Okay, so we can match those two. And the last one, again, we should look at the three zero slopes. Three zero coordinates. Negative, negative slope, positive positive y coordinates, negative, negative y coordinates, positive y coordinate, positive slope. Fourth degree polynomial should differentiate to a third degree polynomial. Okay, so that's the other criteria we can we can use. For this one here, this is the last page, the mean value theorem, okay, the mean value theorem is says that the average slope can of between uh, the points a and b can be the should show up as a instantaneous slope somewhere between a and b if the function is smooth and continuous okay 
So the key is, what is the criteria for the mean value theorem to apply? Okay, the mean theorem and value theorem, I'll just quickly sketch it out. Mean value theorem says this. If I want between those two points, the average slope between those two points should show up as a tangent slope somewhere at least once. Here's, I've drawn it as twice, but the instantaneous slope must happen in between those endpoints. What it relies on is smoothness and continuity. So this is not smooth. This is not smooth. We cannot apply the mean value theorem here. Here we can. Okay, so in, if I just choose an interval, there's my average slope. We know that the instantaneous slope happens somewhere in there because it's smooth and continuous. So that's the mean value theorem. It relies on smooth, smoothness and cont continuity. Okay. And that's the mean value theorem or MVT. The last thing here is this, or sorry, it's not the last one, but number 10 is to do with differentiability. Differentiability needs smooth and continuous. Okay, so this function is differentiable for all the points where it's smooth and continuous. So which means that there's a non-smooth point, there's a non-smooth point, there's a discontinuous point. So it, it is differentiable for values x less than negative one, but not equal to negative one, okay, between one and negative one, okay, but not equal to one, between one and two, okay, it's not differentiable at two because that is an end point, and then from two on, it again is smooth and continuous. Okay, smooth and continuous, straight line is smooth and continuous. So those are the parts that are differentiable, or conversely, those red parts are non-differentiable points. Okay. Uh, we're kind of going to assume that those are not endpoints, and we'll just say that they, they go on forever. All right, finally, last one here. For the function f of x equals e to the x 3 sine x plus 1, how we can we use the IVT or intermediate value theorem, theorem to show that a solution to the equation that that a solution to the equation of zero equals this f of x exists between pi over two and three pi over two? Well, what is the intermediate value theorem? IVT means that as long as the function is continuous, okay, I know that all the values in between this point and this point so i'm going to call this f of and i'm going to call this a and call this position b okay we know that all the points in here or i'm i should say all the points from f of a to f of b exist in the interval a to b so, if I want to show this then, what I can actually do is, <coughs> I can test that endpoint, f of pi over 2, and just plug it in. So, pi over 2 is equal to 0 plus 1, so that's e to the pi over 2. Okay. Uh, oops, so it's going to be, no, that's not right. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, so we're going to get 3 times 1 plus 1 is 4 e to the pi over 2. Okay, So we can say that that point there is going to be whatever that is. I can also find the, other, the y corner of the other endpoint when I plug it in. At, neg at 3 pi over 2, sine is negative 1, so I end up with negative 2. So that's going to be negative 3 plus 1, so negative 2, e to the 3 pi over 2. Well, if I were to sketch this graph, I'm going to sketch this graph in its context. So I'm going to just get rid of this one here and draw this one in context here. So essentially what this graph is saying that it at pi over 2, I have some point up here. 
at 3 pi over 2, I have some point down here. I've got a positive coordinate. We know this is positive because E is always positive. This is negative, again, because E is always positive. So I've got a point here. And I don't know what it looks like in between, but I know it's continuous. It could be jagged, doesn't matter, but I know it's continuous. And if that's the case, I know there needs to be at least one zero that occurs. Okay, so we know that a solution must exist due to IVT. Because it's continuous, we know that by IVT, a zero must exist for this equation.